in the world around us, there are a multitude of religions. They all will tell you that they've got the truth, and most of them will tell you that in the end, it really doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't really doesn't matter how you live. As long as you ask Jesus Christ to be your saviour, he will save you. Well, friends, what we've read in that reading this evening is actually quite different to that, isn't it? Because what, what the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of God, says there is that we can be the servant of two things. We can either serve righteousness or God, or we can be the servants of sin. And by sin, it's talking about the nature that we bear, the source of sin. We can be servants to our own lusts. And he tells us in the last verse the ultimate outcome of that. He says, for the wages of sin, or king sin, pays wages death. They are just wages for obeying king sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if we are the servants of God and we've identified with the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a hope of eternal life. So what we're seeing immediately as we look at this chapter is that it's quite different to what the churches around us will say. So let's begin by having a look at what is religion. Well, friends, religion is, a, is, is actually, as we know it, is a, a Latin word. It comes from the Latin religio, to bind again. And we could define religion as that system of means by which the breach made by sin between God and man is repaired. And the wound that was inflicted upon man as a result of sin, that is, a sin-prone dying person, is healed. You see, that's the means by which man is bound again, is brought again. You see, what we're seeing, friends, is that man has offended God. And God has set out a means by which man can be reconciled to God. Man has the choice either to accept or to reject that opportunity. The word religion does actually occur in the Bible and... The meaning is actually very interestingly, very closely related. Thayer defines the word that's used for religion, it's used in James, and we're not specifically going to look it up. Um, it talks about the religion that God requires. It means religious worship, and it comes from a root word meaning fearing or trembling or fearing God. Now I submit to you, friends that the religions of the world around us do not actually fear God. We're going to have a look at that idea when we come to Isaiah shortly. So what we want to do, friends, is we want to now establish God's purpose and where man is in relation to that purpose at the moment. Because we want to see, is man in harmony with the purpose of God or is man out of harmony with it? What we're going to see is indeed the latter is indeed the case. You see, God's purpose is set out in a number of passages, and, and one of them in particular, which is particularly succinct, is Numbers chapter 14 and verse 21. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, and God had just said to Moses that he was going to destroy the whole of that generation that had come out of Egypt, they were going to wander for 38 years until they were dead. And God says, here's why. Here's why they're going to wander for 38 years until they're dead. He says, because, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's why he destroyed a whole generation of people because they were not in harmony with that purpose. They'd rejected it. They'd decided to do their own thing. 
And what God is saying to Moses here is that God desires to fill the earth with people who manifest or show forth his mental, his moral, and ultimately his physical glory. So they've begun to think like him. They begin to act like him. And the result of those, if you've still got Romans chapter 6 there, you see, they become the servants of righteousness when they think like God and act like God. They are certainly not serving sin when they live like that, are they? And so the gift of God for them is eternal life, to be made immortal like God. And you see, that's how God's going to fill the earth with his glory. So what's the implications of this thing? Well, how we live and worship God demonstrates the extent to which we have or have not developed the moral and mental and moral likeness of God in our lives. It also demonstrates our attitude towards God and his character. What we think of God and his purpose. So what we're seeing, friends, is that we have a choice. We can do it our way and reject God's way. Or we can become obedient unto God, obedient unto righteousness, in the terms of Romans chapter 6. And we can be part of God's purpose to fill the earth with his glory. You see, friends, we said religion means to bind again. And if, for instance, your next door neighbour was to offend you, say he came into your backyard and broke down that magnificent tree you've got in your front yard that you've been looking after for 20 years, and he's watched you and he's come and he's broken it down, and there it is, it's dead. And you're highly offended. And, he say, and you say, well... Go and buy me another one and I'll forgive you. And he comes along with a little punnet of petunias. There you go. Are you going to have you has he fulfilled the requirements to forgive him? He hasn't, has he? And you have every right to say, Well, that's not what I asked for. You see, in a small way, that's demonstrating what the religions of the world have done to God. God has said to man, this is what I require. Man's come along and said, no, no, we'll do it this way. And they wonder why God is going to reject what they've suggested. Okay, let's now have a look. Is there, in fact, a breach between God and man? Well, we can demonstrate this by going to Genesis chapter 1 and comparing what... Man was like in the beginning when God created the earth and what man was like, well, just a couple of chapters later. So in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, we're told, And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So by the end of the sixth day of creation, God looked at everything that he had made, and that included man, and it was very good. Now we put a parallel passage to that. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright. You see, God made man upright. And he put them in a garden and he gave them a law. He says, this is what I require of you. He says, of the trees of the garden you can freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... You can't eat it, don't touch it. And what God's saying is, I'm going to teach you the knowledge of what's good and evil. I'm going to teach it to you. You can choose to get it from somewhere else if you want. But I'm telling you, that's not what is the right way to go. And what happened? Well, man disobeyed that requirement that God put upon them. He broke the law and he came under the curse 
in Genesis chapter 3, the law of sin and death. So that when, by the time we get to Genesis, well, in Genesis chapter 3, we're told that dust thou art, and under dust shalt thou return. Man will become a dying creature. And in Genesis chapter 8, we're told concerning that man that the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You see, Adam and Eve didn't begin like that. You see, they took upon them the thinking which the serpent directed them to. And that became the natural way of man. And as Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29 continues, they sought out many inventions. They turned their back on the knowledge that God gave them and turned to the knowledge that came from the serpent. And the result was that man became sinning, dying creatures. The imagination of his heart is evil from his youth. And he's de destined to return to the dust. You see, friends, what we've seen is that ultimately there is a breach. Man sins and does so regularly. Man is dying. None of these things bring glory to God. God gets no glory from the death of the wicked. And if you're in Romans, let's just come back to Romans chapter 3 and let's just understand the extent to which these things are to be understood according to the Scriptures. Because in Romans chapter 3 and in verse 23, we're told by the Apostle Paul, a very, very succinct little statement. He says, for all have sinned. He doesn't leave it there. He defines what he means by that. And come short of the glory of God. And what he's saying, friends, is to, is to come short of the glory of God is sinning. You see, what was God's purpose? It was to fill the earth with his glory. Anything short of that is sin. Now, friends, you might have come to this lecture this evening thinking that sin was when you do extremely bad things. Well, that is what the Bible says about sin. Instead of it being a pinpoint thing that only a few people ever do, in actual fact, it's a very wide thing that everyone has done except the Lord Jesus Christ. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All, therefore, need religion. All, therefore, need to be bound again. Let's come over to the Old Testament, to Isaiah chapter 55, because in Isaiah chapter 55, the, apostle, the, uh, the prophet Isaiah tells us a little more about these things, about the natural way of man. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7 to 9 where he says he tells us that there is an actual fact no harmony between God and man naturally let's have a look what he says in verse from verse well we'll start from verse 6 seek ye the Lord while he may be found call ye upon him while he is near so while there's an opportunity we need to be seeking the Lord because he's the, that's the only means to get out of this mess that man has got themselves into. Verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. And you might say, well, I'm not wicked. No, in actual fact, what, we, what he's saying here is that we all begin life in that situation. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So his ways and his thoughts. This is the mental and the moral, isn't it? He says they're naturally out of harmony with God. He says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. You see, God is certainly prepared to pardon our sins. But we need to turn from the natural ways which are natural to us. Verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
You see, the natural ways and the natural thoughts of men are out of harmony with God. And we saw that in, 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 uh, in, in Genesis chapter 8, didn't we? We saw that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. We tend to reject the ways of God naturally. And what we've got to do is forsake that way and turn to God. That's what the scriptures are teaching us. And friends, if you found this quite different to what you've heard in other churches, it's because it is. But what I tell you is that's what the Bible says. And you've seen it in black and white before your eyes. So the question is, friends, how can we be bound again? Or how can that breach be healed between God and man? We want to come to... A couple, over a couple of chapters to Isaiah chapter 66. We saw how that in the Bible, the word for religion, that Greek word for religion, talks about fearing God. Well, here it is in Isaiah chapter 66. Just coming back to that definition, it means fearing or trembling or fearing God. That's the idea of religion as it's used in the Bible. Well, Isaiah chapter 66 picks up this, this idea. Where Almighty God says in verse 2, and we really only want to pick up the second half of that verse, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. And trembleth at my word. And the word look is a very interesting word. It means to look intently. So he doesn't just give a cursory glance, oh yeah, they're good people. No, he looks intently. That implies care, interest. Why? Because they are the people that he is going to use to fill the earth with his glory. And so God is prepared to look intently after those people. And they're, what sort of people are they? Well, it's the poor. The word is, uh, in many other translations, translated as humble. So God's looking for the humble. Why is he looking for the humble? Because have you ever tried to tell a proud person that he might actually be wrong? You'll go away realising that in fact you were wrong, won't you? We've got to have the humility before God to accept that, yes, we very often get it wrong. That's what God's telling us. He's looking for people who are humble. And then he goes and he says, and of a contrite spirit. The word contrite means crushed. So a crushed or broken spirit. It's used in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. Actually, keep your hand there. Come back to Isaiah 57 and verse 15. Because there's a beautiful little cross-reference that Isaiah gives us here. He's, he, where he says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. That's God himself. This is what God says, whose name is holy. It's separate. It's holy. That's what the word holy means. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You see who God's interested in? Those who are humble. Those who have a contrite spirit. And the word contrite simply means, as we said, crushed or broken. It's someone who's got no confidence in himself. What he's recognised is he can't fix his problem. He needs God. He needs the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, he's going to find his place in the grave forever. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. 
And that's what God, that's the sort of person that God is looking intently to. And let's see the last idea. And this is the powerful one, probably the most powerful of them. And trembleth at my word. Now there is the, the idea of the New Testament meaning of religion. Rotherham translates that, careth anxiously for my word. Now what does that mean, friends? Does this mean that you take the Bible and you put it in an extra, in an extra bit of padding to look after it? What it means, friends, is that we read that word carefully and make sure that we are keeping every requirement that God gives us. And when we fail of it, how do we feel? Do we say, so what? Like the proud of this world? Or do we turn to God to seek for forgiveness? That's the sort of person that God's looking for. Someone who trembles at his word. And you know, friends, there's a, there's a word in the Bible that... Is, is, is related to this. And it talks about the fear of God. And actually word, mean, word which means reverence. And it speaks of someone who has such a great love for someone that they fear to offend them. And the only way we can put ourselves truly in that situation is by coming to a thorough knowledge of God's word and what God requires and applying it in our lives. So what we've looked at, friends, is, I guess, a little bit of theory. But what we're seeing, friends, is that what God requires is real. Now we're going to go over and have a look now at these things and their practicalities. Because, friends, out there in the world, you're probably told by the churches that, well, some religions will tell you that when you die, you're going to waft off to heaven. Other religions say a bit of both. Some are going to heaven. Some are going to hell. Some are going to, go, some are going to, to live on the earth. What does the Bible say? And that's where we need to turn. We need to tremble at his word, to care anxiously for what God says, to look at it carefully. So we perhaps could summarise it. The Bible offers just one hope. Not two, not three, just one hope. And that's, those words are actually contained in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and, and pick it up. Where the Apostle Paul, speaking to the Ephesians, says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. He says there, There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. There's a few things there that the religions of this world don't really believe. And so that one hope, friends, is variously described in the Bible. It's the hope of the resurrection from the dead. That was what the Apostle Paul stated to be his hope. Of the resurrection from the dead. To inherit eternal life. Didn't we read in Romans chapter 6, the gift of God is eternal life? It's the hope of the promise made of God under the fathers. You might like to make a note of Genesis chapter 13, where in verses 14 to 17, God said to Abraham, to look northward, southward, eastward and westward, all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. You see, that's the promise made under the fathers, or part thereof. It's the hope of salvation. It's the hope of eternal life. As we saw in Romans chapter 6, but you might like to have a look at Titus chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, verse 7 in your own time. So that's the hope that God holds out for us. To inherit the earth in the kingdom of God being raised from the dead to have, have salvation and eternal life forever. And the Bible tells us that that was the hope that was promised to the fathers, as we said in Genesis 13. That's indeed the case. 
So what, therefore, must we do in order to be saved? Well, God requires us to develop a belief and faith in what he has promised and his means of salvation by a thorough knowledge of the word of God and by being enlightened thereby. He requires us to have an understanding and to put a difference between what is godly and what is ungodly. What is right in the eyes of God and what is wrong. What God loves and what God hates. He requires us to be baptised. And by baptism, as we saw in Romans chapter 6, we identify with the sacrifice of Christ, with the putting to death of the old man and his ways, arising from the waters of baptism to a new way of life. And then God requires a walking in a new way of life that's different to the old way. You see, as we saw in Romans chapter 6, and as we saw in, in, in Isaiah 55, we, the natural ways of man are so different to those of God. And therefore, there's a need for a new way of life. So first of all, God requires us to have a knowledge of the word of God. And friends, that's absolutely essential. How can we know what God requires of us if we don't know what the book he's given to us tells us? It's quite simple to understand, isn't it? You see, the Apostle Paul, in writing to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse, um, verse 4, he tells us that, he's, he's, uh, that God will have all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You see, that's what God requires. In order to be saved, they need to come to a knowledge of the truth. The Apostle Paul, in the very next book, in the second letter that he wrote to Timothy, tells us that it is possible to have the wrong sort of knowledge. So we can go and get the knowledge from, well, Adam and Eve got it from the serpent, didn't they? We can go and get it from the world outside. It's not going to help us. We need to get it from the word of God. We need to get it from God. And that was the lesson of Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. We can have the wrong sort of knowledge. He talks to Timothy about people who are ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. He uses exactly the same words. He says one group of people, they're ever learning, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth. Instead, God says that in order to be saved, we need to come to a knowledge of the truth. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, God tells us that, or through the Apostle Peter, he tells us that, gra that godliness, grace and peace come through the knowledge of his word. That's the effect that it has upon our life. Now let's take a little step back and let's just put this into context with what we've been talking about. God said to Moses that he desired to fill the earth with his glory. And we said that that was people thinking like God and acting like God and who would ultimately be made immortal like God. Well, this is that first stage. People coming to a knowledge of the, of the truth, beginning to think like God. And then in 2 Peter chapter, two, uh, chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3, well, we've got people starting to act like God. And so there's a change. And the Lord Jesus Christ said in John chapter 17 and verse 3, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And that word know means to have a thorough and intimate knowledge. In other words, it's not something that we've just got a cursory idea of. It implies study, a thorough knowledge of the subject. 
That's life eternal. Because why? Because it has an effect upon how we think and how we live. Because if we're going to be like God, we have to understand what God is like. And one of the best ways to understand like God is, what God is like is to see the Lord Jesus Christ because he is, was a perfect manifestation of God in the way he lived. You see, what is the power of that word? Well, let's come to, to, to Psalm 119, because in Psalm 119, Almighty God tells us what the power of that word is in our life and how it is able to, to, to work in our daily life. Because, friends, that is so important. Every decision that we make in life needs to be with the word of God in mind. Because how can we think like God and act like God if that's not how we're living from day to day? You see, this is true religion. This is what true religion is. Let's have a look at Psalm 119 and we want to go to verse 9. In verse 9 we're told... Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word? So the word of God can cleanse or make pure. That's what the word cleanse means, to make pure our way of life. It's able to cleanse our way of life from the natural way to God's way. Let's go on to verse 105, where we're told the word of God is a lamp unto our, our, our feet and a light unto our path. Now, friends, for many years, I thought, well, that's just saying the same thing two ways. In actual fact, one day I looked more closely. And this is what we need to do with the Word of God. We need to look more closely. Because what you'll find there, if you look closely, is the word lamp is a small bowl-like object with oil and a wick. It gives us light just around our feet, so that we don't stumble and fall on that which is right in front of us. And so it helps us with the little decisions from day to day in life. That's what the Word of God is able to do. But then he says, it's a light unto our path. And friends, that's the word that's used to describe the sun. It's a light. It's a very powerful light source. So it's able to see into the distance so that we can see exactly where we're going. We can have a long-term view of where we are going. And so, in actual fact, it's an example of why we need to read the Scriptures very carefully. Because the Word of God is able to help us in every step of the way. But it's also able to help us with our long-term goals and the direction that we are going in life. That's the power of this book. Well, let's read verse 130, because it tells us how it's going to work. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. It's not going to work if it's on the shelf. It's got to be entering in as we read it and think about it. It's got to have effect, an effect on the way we live. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians says, For ye were formerly darkness. That's what we were like before the word of God affected us. We were in darkness, stumbling all over the place, spiritually speaking. But now are ye light in the, war, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walk as influenced by the enlightening power of the Word of God. That's what he's telling us. Well, what then practically does this do? Well, it enables us, friends, to put a difference between right and between wrong. And let's come to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Because what we're going to see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is that God is specific about what he requires in our way of life. He requires us to separate from some things and to identify with others. Because he says here, 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 through to verse 18, he says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship, what sharing together hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial, or him that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and, and they shall be my people. And now he gives us the warning. You see, what he's saying is if the word of God truly affects us, we've got to be prepared to make moves in life. We've got to be prepared to live in a way that's in harmony with that. And that's going to affect our, our very relationships. He says, wherefore, come out from among them. From among what? He's telling us to come out from among those whose way, whose teaching is unrighteous. Who's not according, whose, whose teaching is not according to the word of God. Whose teaching is darkness. You see, the word of God is light. That which is against the word of God is darkness. We need to come out from that. And then God says, verse 17, Therefore come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. So you've got to be prepared to make the move in life. That's what God requires of us. You see, it's a very serious matter, isn't it? And so the, the Apostle Peter says, Concerning those who have who have done this, he says, For you are a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation, you are a peculiar people, you're different. That ye should show forth the praises. And if you've got a margin like mine, in, in that particular location, it actually says the virtues. That you should show forth the virtues of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. In other words, there's a mental and moral change in the way we live. It's according to the word of God. Because why? We've studied it. We tremble at his word. We care that we do what is right according to his word. So friends, what we've seen is that there needs to be an understanding of the word of God to be enlightened thereby and a change in the way we live. A way of life that is directed from the word of God as it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Now, the next step that we, we mentioned was, in actual fact, baptism. Now, what does baptism symbolise? Well, friends, it's an identification and an agreement with the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That like as Christ went down into the, into the grave for three days and three nights. So we go down into the waters of baptism, we rise to a new way of life. And that's what we read of in Romans chapter in Romans chapter 6. Now let's perhaps just come to Romans chapter 6 and we'll have a look at a few of these points very briefly. And while you're going there, we'll, I'll just mention to you that uh, it's a means by which our sins are washed away. It's a washing away or forgive me, we receive the forgiveness of our sins. And that's what... The Apostle Paul says, when he was told, he says that he was told to arise and to be baptised and to wash away his sins. Let's have a look what, Roman, what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and see how that in actual fact it's a symbolic burial and resurrection, identifying with what the Lord Jesus Christ did and agreeing with what he did. You see, let's see, verse, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptised into Jesus Christ, were baptised into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so what he's telling us is that there needs to be a change. A change from serving sin, putting to death the old man, that serves sin and beginning a new way of life that serves righteousness. 
And it's an agreement with what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Now, let's just stop and think. What did the Lord Jesus Christ do? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ willingly submitted to the death of the cross. And that was a willing submission from a man who never sinned. It was, friends, a condemnation of sin in the flesh. It was a condemnation of the source of sin. And what he was saying, friends, is that God was just in sentencing man to death. And that the flesh, sin, as it's used in Romans chapter 6, can produce nothing good. Now, by being baptised, we agree with that. And if we agree that the, that the nature which we bear can produce nothing good, and therefore we need to serve God rather than ourselves, then what sort of way of life are we going to have to live after that? We've got to live a way of life that serves God. And so he tells us, so um, in just moving on in the overhead we have before us, we, we're, we're in, in Galatians chapter 3, in verse 26 to 29, we're told that by baptism we become in Christ and heirs according to the promise that was made to Abraham to inherit the earth. And as a result of our baptism... We are symbolically released from the bondage and the slavery of sin. We become the servants of God or the servants of righteousness unto eternal life. And that's the subject of Romans chapter 6, which we have read in our readings. And so the Lord Jesus Christ instructed his disciples, didn't he, in Mark chapter 16, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. So there's two choices we have. We can choose to identify with the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ and live a life in harmony with that, or we can be condemned. And so the result then, friends, after being baptised, is that we need to live a new way of life. It's not just continue on our old way, it's a new way of life. It must reflect the glorious character of God in our life. It's got to be consistent with the principles of our baptism. A few examples. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, where we're told that we should show forth his praises. That's God's praises, God's virtues. We need to be prepared to tell people what we believe. First to Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, where we're told to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, let your light so shine before men. Man, what's that light? It's the word of God affecting us, isn't it? Let that light show shine before men that they may see your good works. And who are they going to glorify? They're going to glorify God because they come to understand that that's the effect of the word of God in our life. And friends, here is the point, really, at which many religions part company because many religions are really about glorifying the preacher glorifying self. The religion of the Bible is about glorifying God. So we want to ask the question, friends, when will the hope that we have in the Bible be realised? Well, the answer is, friends, that our reward is in fact currently in heaven. 
And we're told that in, in John chapter chapter three, 14 and verse uh, verse 3. Let's, go, let's come and have a look at that in John chapter 14 and verse 3. The Lord Jesus Christ, as he was about to ascend into heaven, he says that he goes to prepare a place for you. He says, in my Father's house, in verse 2, are many mansions or abiding places. That's what it means. It's the same word as dwelleth in verse 10, of abode in verse 23. He says, in my Father's house are many, many abiding places. If it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, there's plenty of room. And I go to prepare a place for you. So he says, I'm going to ascend to heaven to prepare a place for you in the kingdom of God. That's what he's going to do. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, if you didn't read that carefully, you might suppose that the reward is in heaven. But we need to read the Bible carefully, don't we? He says, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. But I'm going to come again to receive you unto myself. And that's consistent with the other passages of Scripture. We're going to see Revelation 22 and verse 12 is at the bottom of the overhead, isn't it? So therefore we're told to not lay up treasure on earth, not build up our empire, our riches, but to lay up treasure in heaven. And that's by developing a mental and moral likeness to God in our life through the power of this book in our life. Because Christ is going to return to this earth very shortly. And his reward and his reward will be with him when he returns to the earth. That was what the Apostle Paul said when he was about to die in 2 Timothy chapter 4, where he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That love his appearing. That desire to see his return to this earth. And in the very last page of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, in speaking to John, says in Revelation 22 and verse 12, he says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. And that's what God is intending to do is to send his son back to this earth to reward every man according as their work shall be. And the question he's going to ask is, have they identified with the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And have has their way of life shown forth mentally and morally the glory of God? Is that being developed? Is there something in them worth saving? Now, I said I wasn't going to go to the use of religion in the Bible. Well, I've changed my mind. Let's come to James chapter 2. Because we're going to see that word, religion, which, as we said, was fearing, was, was, was worship. Well, it comes from a word which means to fear God. Or to tremble at God's word? Well, this is what he says. In verse 26 and 27. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Now that's interesting, because what he's telling us is that right down to what we say is important. Even the things that flow out of our mouth so very, very quickly and very, very easily, they're important, and they will be judged. But read the next verse. 
pure religion. Now that's what we want. And undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. That's the effect of that word of God practically worked out in our lives. We could go to Matthew chapter 25 and see how the judge is going to judge people according as they've done to others. But the last phrase is very telling. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. What is he telling us, friends? What is the influence in your life? What is directing you from day to day in your life? What is your long-term goal in life? Is it influenced by the world? Or has it come from the Word of God? Because Adam and Eve in the beginning chose to be influenced by the serpent the world around them and rejected God. We need to be influenced by God. His word needs to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. That's the effect that God's word needs to have in our life. So let's finally summarise by pointing out what we pointed out in the beginning that true religion is the means God has provided by which the breach made by sin between God and man can be repaired. It's through that work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have the forgiveness of our sins and ultimately receive immortality, the redemption of our body. That wound, therefore, that came as a result of sin can be healed. We have a choice, friends. We can accept or reject God's means of binding again or God's offer of salvation. The Proverbs tell us, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's the natural way of man. He thinks it's right. But the word of God says otherwise. The Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 7, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there, go, that many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life. And few there be that find it. See the point? There's this big, big, wide gate. And everyone going along that path will naturally go straight in that gate. There's a few people that are looking for the way that leads to life. And if they're looking, God will help them to find it. May that be your lot, friends.